In 2005, two female police officers were shot whilst attending an emergency call. Sharon Beshanivsky lost her life. Her colleague, Teresa Milburn, was seriously injured. I heard a bang, saw Sharon's head just fall to the right and then plop forward. This callous criminality shocked the country. The crime is horrendous. No, it doesn't get much more serious than this. This is the story of how their colleagues went to the ends of the earth to bring to justice the people who did it. Somalia, one of the most lawless places on earth. A roadblock is waiting to catch a fugitive. The man isn't wanted here. He is wanted 5,000 miles away in Britain. For two years, he's evaded justice, but now the British and Somali intelligence services are closing in. His name is Mustaf Jama, and he is wanted for murder. All they have to do now is catch him. The story begins two years earlier in Bradford, when a quiet November afternoon was shattered by an emergency call to the police. For PC Sharon Beshtanivsky, a new recruit to West Yorkshire Police, it should have been a day to celebrate. It was her daughter Lydia's fourth birthday and a family party was planned. Her husband Paul had been looking forward to this day for weeks. Sharon had also swapped her shifts around because of Lydia's birthday and then I sort of got, got me orders to make sure I'm home on time. Uh, for Lydia's birthday, sort of everything were organised uh, for a party but, and, and Sharon says, well, I'll be home early, as early as I can. And I sort of went to work and she went to work. Teresa Milburn was Sharon's partner for the shift. They were friends on their team, but it was the first time they'd worked together. It was a 7-4 shift, uh, early as we call it. It was uh, briefing at seven o'clock, um, briefing and we got allocated as rules for that day. And we were what we called uh, the task at care, driving around the hotspot areas of Bradford, uh, being proactive, stopping people, helping people, not actually answering any calls as such. Just 30 minutes before they were due off duty, a travel agent close to the city centre activated a silent panic alarm that went direct to the police control room. Anywhere, Anywhere. Don't go into Great Street. We both made the comment of, oh, it's half past three, Friday afternoon, and it'll be a, a false call. Obviously, it were Sharon's daughter's birthday that day. She didn't want to work over sat there and it was like, we're going right past it, aren't we? Yeah, I suppose we better go then, aren't we? Yeah, we'll answer it then. And we set off. The decision to take the call would change everything. It was from Universal Express travel agents on Morley Street, just half a mile from the central police station. A CCTV camera captured their arrival. As we got there, saw two street wardens and they crossed the road over to us and says, um, there's something not right, um, doors are locked. So we crossed over at road. The two officers were now just moments away from tragedy. Sharon walked in front of me. I've immediately followed her and it's all I've been couple of steps, not, not far at all, um, and 
She, she just stopped. She, she stopped and go away. Sharon's parents were here, all the kids were here, a few friends. They'd been here sort of most of the morning, organising everything and cake and, and all this for sort of Lydia's party. And, you know, sort of everything were more or less in hand, just waiting for a sort of Sharon to come home. I heard a bang. So Sharon's head just fall to the right and then plop forward. And then she just collapsed. I saw an Asian man and I saw a gun and then I was shot myself. The impact spun Teresa down the street. She had been shot in the top part of her chest at point-blank range. She pressed the panic button on her radio. A code zero alert to all the officers in her division that she and Sharon were in trouble. Every officer on duty raced to the scene. Among the first was PC Nicola Smith, one of Teresa's closest friends. When you hear your code zero go off, it's... It's like getting a bottle of electricity through your body. Whatever you're doing, you just drop it. Teresa came over quite broken. It weren't a, a clear sentence, a clear message that came out. It was broken words. Not enough to paint the picture of what we found when we got there. Most Code Zero alerts are to officers under attack. Matthew Scott expected to find his two female colleagues in a fight. So we pulled up at the side of the street and I remember looking across and just seeing Sharon laid there on the floor. There was Teresa just again laid on the street. And I could hear Teresa's voice, but couldn't really make out what was going on, but knew at that point that obviously something really, really badly had gone wrong. Teresa had blood coming out of her mouth. She would obviously know a lot of pain and she'd been shot, so the only thing I was thinking is that I wanted to keep her talking and I wanted to keep her conscious. And the thing that she said more than anything else is, how oh, Sharon, where Sharon, is Sharon OK? Chaos followed. Passers-by had also rushed to help. CCTV cameras frantically panned the streets for any sign of the gunman. At the travel agents, officers tried desperately to give first aid to their colleagues. I went up to see how Sharon was doing. And by that time, there was two officers already with her. And we'd sort of uncovered and found where, where the gunshot wound was. There was no, no blood at all, there was just a small hole in the top of her chest. I could see that Sharon were being resuscitated at this point on the road, and I didn't want Teresa to realise how bad that situation was. Another officer had come to join us and I moved his body to block any view so that Teresa couldn't see what was going on with Sharon. As Sharon and Teresa were rushed to hospital across the city, Paul and the family were still waiting for Sharon to come home. A car pulled up at the top of the drive and I sort of, oh, police car, and I sort of automatically assumed, oh, she's having to work over. So then police officer came down drive and, you know, the conversation will then, you know, can I have a word with you in private. You know, there's been an incident and you can have to come with me. He was driven straight to accident and emergency. All Paul knew was that his wife had been seriously injured on a call. I mean, everything was chaotic. There were sort of armed police there, there were police cars everywhere. And you were just thinking, well, you know, what's sort of going on? Minutes ticked by. Paul waited anxiously for news. Doctor came in and uh, says, you know, Emolis then told me that she'd sort of been shot and she'd passed away. What had started as an armed robbery at a travel agent's in Bradford had ended in murder. 
PC Sharon Beshenivsky was shot dead at the scene. Her colleague Teresa Milburn was also shot at point blank range and was fighting for her life. The man given the task of finding the killer of a colleague was Detective Superintendent Andy Brennan. There was lots of garbled messages at first because the city centre division that covered this were in a state of shock themselves. Two of the colleagues had been shot whilst attending an alarm. It was a little bit confused. There were things happening. Uh, Sharon had been removed, trees had been removed from the scene. All we knew at that point from the initial briefing was that it appeared at that time that this was probably a robbery that had gone wrong. West Yorkshire Police has one of the most successful murder inquiry teams in the country. Every available detective rushed to Bradford for a briefing. One of the first decisions I made was, was a decision to go right back to basics. Let's re-interview all the witnesses, let's ensure we've captured all the basic CCTV, and let's do the basics that we would do in any investigation. The first lead came within an hour of the shooting. Witnesses had seen three men, an Asian and two black men, leave the travel agents and escape in a silver 4x4 car. This sighting was vital. Bradford was the first city in the UK to install Big Fish, a ring of CCTV cameras around the city that record every vehicle entering and leaving, as many as 100,000 images a day. On this screen here we have a map of Bradford, but not only is it a map of Bradford, it also contains every camera location that we have within the city. So for this instance, I've obviously seen the vehicle is on Marley Street, now I'm looking to see where it's left. All the cameras in between these places were checked, unfortunately we didn't locate the vehicle. However, we did see the car coming out of Ransdale Road and indeed it turned right onto Manchester Road. We were then able to check the cameras that we have located further up this road and we were fortunate enough to see this silver 4x4 vehicle. Now detectives had CCTV of the route the killer's car took leaving the city and could identify it as a silver Toyota RAV4 but they couldn't read the number plate or see who was inside. During the midst of our investigation, the information was filtering through. A member of the public had uh, given the partial registration plate, which then alters our inquiry somewhat. Even a part number was crucial. Bradford's Big Fish CCTV system included automatic number plate recognition cameras. All vehicles entering the city have their registrations recorded. The team entered the partial number plate into the database but would it come up with a match? Obviously we had no time scale as to when the vehicle actually entered into the city. It could have been the same day, it could have been days before, we obviously had no idea. The computer trawled through thousands of number plates. After dozens of false matches, they had a hit. Here the 4x4 is recorded coming into the city with its full number plate WP05YTT clearly visible. It's just 30 minutes before the shooting. Now detectives had to trace its owner. We realised quite quickly that it was a hire vehicle from Heathrow Airport. Uh, that vehicle and another one had been hired by the same people. So it was critical on the Friday evening, the Friday night, that we had detectives in the London area looking at who hired them vehicles uh, and what type of people they were. As colleagues scoured the country, Teresa was still in hospital. The bullet struck her on the chest, causing her left lung to collapse. She was lucky to be alive, but didn't know what had happened to her friend. I kept asking, now Sharon will. I remember um, Jez Barrett as inspector. I says, how Sharon? And I remember him saying, she's not good. I can't actually remember anyone telling me that Sharon were dead. I've been told since that the specialist came up to us at that moment and told us that Sharon were dead. I can't remember that. Sharon's family were all too painfully aware of what had happened. 
A day earlier, they'd waited for her to return home for a birthday party. Now they visited the scene of her murder. Her husband, Paul, had to break the news to their children. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Just didn't know how to say it, literally. And sort of how do you explain to your kids that the mother's dead? Once I'd sort of sat them down and sort of told them, it, I think it would have disbelieved to the kids. It just wasn't, you know, because obviously with them being so young, you know, no one's experienced sort of death within family sort of thing. And it's just all tears and crying and whatever else. And it's just like you think, God, you know, it's how, you know, how do you go on from here sort of thing. The shooting brought home the dangers faced by British police officers on a daily basis. When one of your colleagues is killed and another one's shot and is in the hospital, your world kind of comes crashing down that you realise that this could have been any one of us. A number of us got the call and requested to go to the job. Any one of us could have been there and it does make you feel very vulnerable. As well as Sharon's murder, detectives had a vicious and violent robbery to investigate. This might also hold vital clues to the killers. The crime is horrendous. Uh, members of staff, visitors to the premises are actually tied up using cable ties. They're forced onto the ground, the pistol whipped, and uh, they threatened to kill the youngest male, the youngest brother of the, uh, the boys that work there. Now, as robberies go, it doesn't get much more serious than this. Despite being held at gunpoint, the travel agents had secretly activated their silent panic alarm. It was this emergency call that brought Sharon and Teresa to the scene. As the robbers prepared to leave with just £5,000, the officers arrived at the shop door. Sharon and Teresa were immediately shot at point-blank range as the robbers escaped. Forensic teams scoured the shop and the street for clues. Inside, they found a laptop bag that the robbers used to conceal the guns. A knife wielded by one of the men. In the wall, a bullet fired by a Mac-10 submachine gun. And outside, three bullet casings, all fired from a 9mm handgun. As detectives worked around the clock at the scene, the team tasked with tracing the Toyota RAV4 received a call. It had been picked up by the Metropolitan Police in South London. Could this be the breakthrough they were looking for? A series of raids on houses and flats in the capital produced six suspects. An armed police convoy brought them back up the M1 to West Yorkshire for questioning. Experience tells me that you don't automatically assume that they are involved. We know that somehow that vehicle's involved and it's a huge amount of work to have to start eliminating them or implicating them as being involved. It soon became clear the car was being used as a pool car by criminals. But the six suspects had nothing to do with the car at the time of the shooting. It was a setback for the team. People are suddenly realising that you've arrested six people in connection with this horrific crime uh, and suddenly you're going to start bailing people as well. And people start to think, oh, where are we going with this investigation now? It was back to the drawing board for detectives. Luckily, key witness PC Theresa Milburn was making a remarkable recovery. She was ready to return home to be with her husband Chris and 15-year-old son James, and she desperately wanted to help the investigation. Came out of hospital and then did two days of video interviews, which, which are done with key witnesses. Reliving everything again. That was very emotional. Very hard, but you need to do it. You need to do that in order to assist the investigation. And yeah, I had injuries, I was in pain. 
In the rear of the vehicle on this side, we also recovered a Ribena pack, which allowed us to undertake fingerprints and DNA work on that. On this side of the vehicle, we also recovered a water bottle, a sandwich pack and a till receipt from Woolly Edge Service Station. That was timed shortly after 6pm on Friday the 18th of November. By recovering the vehicle within 24 hours, we allowed our forensics people to go through the vehicle to find tooth comb. It gave us some really good forensic opportunities in relation to identifying who'd use that vehicle on the Friday. I was able to identify three people who I believe were responsible for that robbery. They were Musaka Shah, Yusuf Jama, and his brother, Mustaf Jama. These were now the most wanted men in Britain. But where had they gone? Sharon Beshanivsky was not just a police officer who lost her life doing the job she loved. She was also a devoted mum. She was killed on her daughter Lydia's fourth birthday. Now her husband Paul has to adapt to the family life they'd planned without her at the centre. Yeah, well, future plans was, you know, that she could work, I could work a little bit less. And we sort of always wanted to sort of have the sort of country life. We thought it'd be a better life, bringing the kids up with a country life. It was a dream home. We sort of bought it sort of in the, in the summer and all the plans that we had of what we we're going to do and Sharon were even talking about, you know, Lydia having a, a marquee on lawn for a wedding and all this sort of thing, you know. It, it was sort of all pre, everything pre-planned of what you're going to do and, you know, and then everything sort of fell to pieces. Every murder is a challenge for the police, but when one of their own is killed, they are very determined to catch who did it. In West Yorkshire, detectives worked night and day to track down Sharon's killers, and just one week after the murder, were confident they knew who they were looking for. They were Muzaka Shah, Yusuf Jama, and his brother Mustaf all members of a London-based criminal gang. We've got three very dangerous individuals who are on the run who demonstrated the total disregard for the police by shooting two of them already. So it's a genuine fear that we have that clearly they could attack other police officers if they were cornered. The gang's base was an estate in North London called Graham Park. They called themselves the Thug Fam. Muzaka Shah was their leader. On his shoulder, he carried a five-star tattoo to show he was in charge. His life revolved around violent crime. In this rap song, he sings about guns, gangs and killing a cop. His key lieutenants were Somalian asylum seekers Yusuf and Mustaf Jama. They both had a string of convictions. Ironically, Mustaf had been allowed to stay in the UK because to return him to Somalia would have breached his human rights. The gang were not afraid to use guns. Detectives believe this is Muzaka Shah robbing a North London off-licence at gunpoint. Seven months later, he would travel to Bradford to carry out a similar attack. Before escaping, incredibly, he fires his gun indiscriminately. In Bradford, witnesses said that Shah carried a 9mm pistol and a Mac-10 submachine gun was carried by one of the brothers. Ballistics at the crime scene revealed both weapons were fired. Police believe the Mac-10 jammed, preventing more people being killed. Both of these weapons are widely available among criminal gangs in the UK. For unarmed police officers, they are an increasing threat. 
Nine millimeter caliber pistols are probably about the most widespread uh, pistols available to the criminal fraternity. There's an awful lot of them on the black market that come in from you know, Eastern Europe and uh, it's quite easy to pick one up, obviously, if you have the right contacts. Pistols like this are so iconic, uh, even pointing one at someone can be quite intimidating. For Sharon and Teresa to be confronted by a weapon like this is unimaginable. The other gun was even more sinister. This is a Mac 10 machine pistol capable of firing 1,100 rounds per minute. That's almost 20 every second. Very much a gun of choice with uh, gangs. It's become a bit of a symbol of handheld firepower. They're quite an extreme level. When fired, the gun actually rocks around and uh, the rounds will tend to spray everywhere. Hence the term spray and pray. It's very indiscriminate. These were the weapons in the hands of the three fugitives now on the run. Police forces across the UK were put on high alert. For seven days, nothing. Then, a hundred miles away in Birmingham, a breakthrough. West Midlands police were called to a reported gang rape. We've got um, sort of ten people that have been arrested for rape. We've got a victim that was very traumatised as well, so we're having to deal with her. We've got a number of scenes that we had to secure evidence from, and also we had to recover forensic evidence from all of the people that were in custody. One of the suspects was taken to the cells by PC Alan Brockbank. He's seen here, booking him in. He had his hat right down, so all we, all we could actually see was just his eyes. When he took all his uh, clothing off, he's totally calm, totally passive, uh, not looking at anybody, but the young WPC who was with me turned to me and said, that's that person that's on the briefing. And she gave the biggest smile I've ever seen. The police suspected the man they had was Yusuf Jama. He told them he was Abdi Ahmed. And we had to try and work out um, whether that was he, the name he'd used before um, and then really just try and work out a best way of confirming it. When the police want to establish a suspect's identity quickly, they use live scan. This is a computer system that can instantly read and compare fingerprints to the millions held on the police national computer. We specifically asked to be compared against Yusef Jama's details because although he was giving false details at the time, we, we believed he was obviously Yusef Jama. Would this be the man they were looking for? So about 10 minutes later, the results came through and it came back on the confirmation page showing it's Yusef Jama uh, with the correct date of birth, obviously born in Somalia. And obviously this is the point where we knew we got the right man. That was like every best arrest you could ever wish to. I, I don't think there was a police officer in the country who didn't want to arrest that person. West Yorkshire Police had the first of their three key suspects, but he wasn't talking. The evidence against him was mounting. A witness had identified him at the scene of the shooting. His fingerprints and DNA were found inside the robber's car. And just three hours after the robbery, he was on CCTV at Woolly Edge Services on the M1. This video shows him buying the items found in the car. Yusuf Jama was charged with Sharon's murder. Police feared the other two wanted men, Mustaf Jama and Muzaka Shah, would leave the country. Determined to stop that happening, a team of detectives revisited the evidence. One of the things we always like to do is to review the CCTV work that's been recovered. And what that gives us is opportunity to identify uh, other potential witnesses, other suspects. And this came as a little bit of a shock to me because they realised that there was probably a second car involved. Detectives spotted a black Mercedes sports car following the Toyota RAV4 out of Bradford after the shooting. On closer examination, they then noticed a green Toyota Corolla was always close by. We'd gone from having three suspects and one vehicle to have now identified three potential vehicles that were involved in the robbery itself. Only three men were seen leaving the travel agents. Only three men were being hunted by the police. 
So who were driving the other cars? How many of them were there? And how were they involved? The investigation was becoming more complex by the hour. For Paul Beshanivsky, the only question that mattered was when would they be arrested? You're thinking, well, are they a step closer? Have they got these people? You know, it was getting to a point, well, are they going to find them? So I thought, well, I need to occupy my mind. I need to do something. So, you know, you, you really lock yourself away work-wise. And, you know, that, that sort of keeps your mind pacified till you come home. Then your kid's asking you questions that you don't have answers to. Four weeks into the inquiry, an anonymous tip-off brought progress. Gang leader Muzaka Shah was hiding out in Newport, South Wales. It then came to our attention that in Newport Dock was a tanker that was about to sail in the next 48 hours to Pakistan. Our fear was that Shah had got to Newport and was a stowaway on this ship, ready to sail off into the sunset back to Pakistan, never to be seen by us again. The ship was secretly held in port while the hunt for Shah continued. Our inquiries had identified three or four houses where we believe Shah was. An armed cordon was put on the addresses and then obviously it was knocking on the doors, loud hailers, getting all the occupants out. Police didn't know whether Shah was still armed with the pistol and machine gun. But 24 hours into their search, he gave himself up. He'd shaved his head in an attempt to disguise his identity. He was immediately taken under armed escort to West Yorkshire for questioning. The surviving police officer hears another loud bang. She says that she feels immense pain and she falls to the ground. And she says, I quote, it was the Asian male who shot me. That's you, isn't it? Like Yusuf Jama before him, Mazaka Shah refused to answer any questions. But his fingerprints found on the laptop bag left inside the travel agents pointed to him. As did his DNA found on cigarette butts and a Ribena carton inside the RAV4. Three days after Shah's arrest, police discovered a Mac-10 weapon and ammunition. Tests proved it was the same one fired by Shah's gang inside the travel agents. And on a plastic bag full of bullets were his fingerprints. Police charged Shah with Sharon's murder and the attempted murder of Teresa. For Teresa, it was comforting to know that the man who had killed her friend was now behind bars. When that phone call came, it was a big relief that he had been arrested. To say that we'd got Shah in custody was uh, an absolute relief, not just for me, but for my family, um, for the whole investigation team. It just ended roller coaster really. Six weeks after the shooting, Sharon's funeral took place at Bradford Cathedral. Once we'd sort of got to the funeral day, I don't know, you sort of, you sort of heart races and, you know, you, you sort of try to think, well, how am I going to cope on this sort of day? And how are the kids going to cope? It won't easy. I walked behind Sharon's coffin because um, I wanted to. I wanted to say goodbye to her respectfully. Every officer that lined the streets that day um, wanted to be there to give Sharon the send-off, the funeral she deserved. Sharon's team carried her coffin. Among them was Matthew Scott. The street was just silent, it was full of people, full of members of the public, but it was completely silent. It sort of gave me the impression that there's still a lot of respect for what it is that we do and the dangers that we face. Sharon may have been laid to rest, 
but the hunt for her killers was not. One key suspect, Mustaf Jama, was still on the run. His image was sent around the world. Then police arrested three men linked to the Mercedes and Corolla cars seen on the CCTV. Police believed these men were the robbers' lookouts, but they were still unclear about how the gang had orchestrated their plan. A day later, they made another arrest, and this time they got the answers they were looking for. The handyman at this house would hold the key. He became a very useful witness. He was actually doing work, handiwork, when he actually overhears this crew talking about doing a robbery. And there's a suggestion that there's many, many tens of thousands of pounds that are going to be available to them. He doesn't get involved in this in any way, shape or form. He's just purely doing his handiwork. But he does notice that they appear to be very excited. He can tell by the tone of the language that they're using. The handyman was initially arrested as a suspect, but it soon became apparent he was a key witness. In this police video, he's seen taking officers around the house. He reveals in remarkable detail the gang's movements after the robbery. So this is the room that this you said is, they is, all came yeah, back into? Everybody with... was in that room. Right. And um, there was one guy, the black guy, who was standing here. Yeah. When he saw me coming, he closed the door. By the time when I was coming, saw... I saw a gun in bed. He is now under police protection and cannot be identified. According to the witness, they obviously then became panicked. They were, they were, they were swearing. In fact, the two Jammer brothers and Shah basically shaved their heads, obviously to change their appearance. That's the over, that we, that we used to over the hair on the floor, yeah? They changed the clothes. They took off the business suits and jackets and shirts. You've asked us to open a wardrobe where there's some clothes. There's three yeah. suit jackets. One of the Jammer brothers said to this witness, go and get some white spirit, and they went outside. So this is where you saw one of the people burning some clothing and some shoes. Shoes, clothes, long trousers. So he describes how the men left the, the Mercedes with two occupants left initially, one of the Somalians left in the RAV4, another one got taken to the railway station, and then three other people left in another car. I've got to take hold of you now. And you can We've got the complete picture now. We know where they all came, we know what they've done and where they left. With the help of this new information, police pieced together their case against the five gang members they'd caught. But there was one man missing. The hunt for Mustaf Jama was still on. But had he fled the country? And would they ever catch him? A year after police officer Sharon Beshanivsky was shot dead during an armed robbery in Bradford, five men stood trial for her murder at Newcastle Crown Court. For Sharon's husband, Paul, it was the first time he'd come face to face with his wife's killers. I didn't feel anything really at all until it sort of went to court and I could actually face them in court, you know, and sort of look at the faces and sort of think, you know, well, you know, Shot my wife, mother to my kids. For for what? For money. Muzaka Shah and Yusuf Jama were sentenced to life for Sharon's murder. After a legal debate, the charge against Shah for the attempted murder of her colleague Teresa Milburn was dropped during the trial. I'll never forget Shah stood there, sentenced to life, minimum of 35 years, and there were friends or family members behind us in the public area, and he just went. So proud of himself in killing someone. Two of the gang's three lookouts were found guilty of manslaughter. They also received life sentences. A third was convicted of robbery and sentenced to eight years. With five of the gang behind bars, Teresa bravely returned to the beat in Bradford and Paul tried to get on with raising his children. 
but both knew the story wasn't over. One of the key suspects, Mustaf Jama, was still on the run. He thought he was beyond reach. Detectives in West Yorkshire believed otherwise. We had strong intelligence suggesting Mustaf Jama uh, had left the UK and had actually returned to Somalia. And that, that was really disappointing because we, we, we tried really hard to find him whilst he was in the UK. He was the third one that had actually gone inside the travel agents. He was the one who had been involved in the robbery itself. And he was the one in the group who shot both officers. After the murder, stories began circulating that Jama had escaped from the UK by using a woman's passport and disguising himself in a burqa. He then fled to the very country he claimed was too dangerous for him to live in. Although we were doing intelligence work with support of the Somali authorities as well as our own intelligence people, we were able to, over a period of 12 to 18 months, narrow down the area of Somalia where we believed he had come from. Jama's family lived in the remote north. His father was a clan leader. Somalia is a world where bitter feuds are common and often settled at the point of a gun. Flushing Jama out would be a difficult and dangerous task. But Somali intelligence was up to it. Through their network of contacts, they received a tip-off. Jama was to make a trip on a road near the Ethiopian border. The team tasked with catching him wreckied the route and set up a roadblock. Now, all they had to do was wait. Then the Somalians had Mustaf Jama in their sights. Their target would be armed. The plan must not fail. We knew there was activity and we, we were onto somebody we believe was actually Mustaf Jama. But there's so many variables going on. You know, there's people operating in a different country. And you're just keeping your fingers crossed. The police surrounded him. With no gun, this time there could be no escape. I got the call on the Sunday afternoon that we, we believed that Mustaf Jama had been arrested. Part of the process for us like, confirming his identity was to get his actual photograph sent over to the UK. Via a laptop and satellite link, the Somali police emailed the photos 5,000 miles to West Yorkshire. Jama waited while confirmation came from across the world that he was the man wanted for murder. West Yorkshire police wanted to get Jama back to Britain as quickly as possible. He would be extradited via Dubai. Andy Brennan flew out to collect him. We sat there waiting for him and we got the indication that at first there was one or two problems with the plane and uh, it was delayed 24 hours, which was a bit concerning because I thought, you, you don't know what's going to go on here. There, there may well be a genuine problem and we can't get him out of Somalia. Finally, the plane took off. Nearly two years after Sharon Beshenivsky's murder, Mustaf Jama would finally come face to face with the officer who vowed to track him down. The plane arrived and uh, I saw him coming down the steps and I was clearing my own mind that that was him at that point. These are the photos of Jama taken at the time by the Somalian police. As I introduced myself and who I was, he, I sensed that he probably knew who I was and I could see the colour clearly drain from him as he realised that uh, the, uh, the game was over. 
It doesn't matter where people go, we will find them and bring them back to the UK to face justice. Mustaf Jama was sentenced to life with a minimum of 35 years for the murder of PC Sharon Beshenivsky. Her death took detectives from West Yorkshire to the ends of the earth to track down the men responsible. This determination saw six members of the gang put behind bars. The officers didn't just do it for British justice, they did it for everyone affected by this cruel crime. And most of all, of course, they did it for their colleague, Sharon Beshenivsky. 